I can ask everyone to take a moment and find a seat. The eight o'clock hour is upon us. Good morning, I'm John Kelker, <clears throat> president of the Springfield Citizens Club. It's a pleasure to have you here, and as we are in that season, I wanna thank any of our elected officials who have joined us here this morning. Special thanks to Norm Sims, who is the sponsor of our coffee this morning. And if any of you are interested in sponsoring coffee, it's $65. It's something we ask of our volunteers and our participants. I also want to thank all of you that are dues-paying members. It's $30. Anyone who has not paid dues and wants to, you can see Carol Sutton in the back of the room. This week on Wednesday, many of us joined and celebrated Bob Gray. I know many of you joined us, and, and I'm sorry for those who couldn't. We recognized Bob for founding this club, the hard work that he did, and we also recognized his birthday. If you've not had a chance this week to wish Bob happy birthday, please do. And we let him know, because of the work our program committee is doing, we are looking at an evening series, and when we develop that, it's going to be named in the honor of Bob Gray to recognize his work. We have a great program today, moving Pillsbury forward, and I'm excited to hear from all three of our speakers. Looking ahead, I'd ask that you mark your calendars. Our April 28th program will feature a sit-down conversation with Illinois Supreme Court Justice Lisa Holder White. And in May, we are planning a roundtable discussion on local media and how this changing environment impacts the information we receive and the news we have access to. For today's program, I'm pleased to be joined by Chris Richman, president of Moving Pillsbury Forward, Assistant United States Attorney John Holzer, and Polly Poskin, Moving Pillsbury Forward board member. To get us started, we will watch a short video that provides a little bit of the history and the story behind this project, and then I'll invite all three of our presenters to join me up front. It's, it's a bit painful to just see it deteriorate and crumble into this. It's, into it's this a bit rain. painful to just see this it. This is a project that needs to happen. And right now, the biggest benefit to the community is get rid of this blight. It really represents the despair that people feel when they don't feel they have any hope. We're at the former Pillsbury Mills here in Springfield at 1525 East Phillips Avenue. Pillsbury was constructed from 1920 to 1929 as, at the time, the largest flour mill in North America. And by post-World War II era, we had almost 1,500 employees here working on not just flour milling, but packaged goods for Pillsbury. At some point in the late 60s, it started to contract just a little bit until 1991 when it sold to Cargill. Cargill then ran the plant for another 10 years. And then unfortunately in 2008, they made the corporate decision to simply sell it for scrap. And unfortunately, the scrap operators, they realized that the metal from the site, the only way to get at it was to remove the asbestos, which unfortunately they did in an illegal fashion. It created a mess, a, a legal mess for them and a mess for the community. When the dust finally settled, Moving Pillsbury Forward formed as a not-for-profit that has taken control of the property, and we're preparing to demolish the structures that are on site, clear the site for redevelopment, and put it back into production for the community. With these types of sites, it's the fear of the unknown. And so a lot of what I do is address that. A lot of the things that we tested for were not present, which is really a good thing. And so now we do have that data 
we can really talk to people and say, hey, you know, this is not as bad as it appears, and what is here is very manageable. We've done water testing at the site, groundwater testing. We've done soil cores all throughout the site, and we've looked at all of the structures to see what level of asbestos or lead paint or other contaminants may exist. There's always standards that we're comparing to. Here, I would say we're on the low to modest side relative to what we found, and we also haven't found a lot of different types of contaminants, so that makes it less complex. The work is straightforward, but there's a, a scale of it. The Pillsbury facility is huge. We have approximately 20 buildings, 585,000 square feet of built space. Six of the buildings that we have on site are under partial demolition already. Those are our highest priority buildings to, to get down just from a public safety standpoint. You know, this is one of the largest brownfield sites in central Illinois. Uh, there are 12,000 people that live within one mile of this site. Our intention is to clean it up, to demolish the structures that are on site and get it back into production for the community. Northside Springfield is a very strong community. So it really breaks my heart now to see what has happened with Pillsbury. You know, people here are struggling. There's a lot of crime that's creeping into the neighborhood. One broken window always creates another one. And so I think just getting rid of this will provide some neighborhood stabilization and then allow it to start rising back up. It's still a great community. There are still great people who live here. We just wanna make sure that they have a safe place to live that is free of environmental concerns and environmental hazards. All told, this is estimated to be a 10 to $12 million project to clear the structures from the 18 acre site such that it can be redeveloped. We're really aiming at a three to five year time frame here, and we're determined to, to see this through. Everybody has a different vision for what could happen here, but I think that's okay. I think that's great because it really gives us kind of a, a, a blank canvas that we can build whatever it is that, that we want to build. I think that what we do here can be something that people all across the country can come and, and talk about. This is not unique. This type of situation is occurring all across the country. So my hope is, is that we will build something here so fantastic that other cities will say, wow, how did you do that? And we want to do it too. Moving Pillsbury forward needs those in, in the community to stand with us to help regenerate this part of the community that once was an economic juggernaut. We need folks to get involved and consider donating. We know it's going to take a financial stack that includes state and federal resources, but we also know that we need local resources to get many of the, the things done here uh, that need to be done. We're working diligently to do that uh, as I stand here today and we'll continue to do that until the project's done. All right, again, I'm, I'm Chris Richmond with the Moving Pillsbury Forward, Polly to my left and, and John to my right. Good morning. I'll uh, start with a little bit of a brief history um, on Pillsbury. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the video, the, the site opens in 1929 as one of the largest flour mills in North America and uh, continues in production and continues expanding. Uh, throughout the Great Depression, it had its first big expansion, and of course that's locally why uh, so many people uh, of a certain age, anyway, in Springfield have such an affinity uh, toward Pillsbury. It expanded throughout the Great Depression. It expanded again uh, with a major expansion in the late 1940s after World War II. Uh, it was a major flour producer during the war effort, uh, World War II. Flour went out all over the world to support the war efforts. And by the mid-1950s, 1,500 people worked there. Um, so Pillsbury sells to Cargill in 1991. 
And I have a lot of people ask me about that. Well, you know, why, why did they sell? Well, actually what happened is in 1988, uh, a company called Grand Metropolitan uh, actually did a hostile takeover of Pillsbury. Um, so they bought shares of the Pillsbury company. Uh, they got a controlling share and uh, took over the board of directors. And over the next two to three years, the Pillsbury company was kind of parsed out. And our facility here in Springfield uh, was parsed out to Cargill. So in uh, 1991, Cargill took ownership of the facility here in Springfield. They shut down the packaged goods element of uh, the facility. And then they just ran the flour mill for another 10 years with uh, a much uh, smaller workforce than Pillsbury had had. Uh, so 2001, Cargill makes the corporate decision to go ahead and, and close the mill. Uh, by that time, there hadn't been a, a, a lot of um, reinvestment uh, into new machinery, new equipment. Um, and, and they just made that corporate decision to shut it down. They marketed the site for another several years. And by 2008, they went ahead and sold the site for scrap. That's when things really started getting pretty tough for the community. Right, it had been closed for seven years. Uh, the neighborhood around it uh, started to suffer a bit, but when it sold for scrap, um, that, was, that was a tough thing. Um, for the next several years, um, the scrap owners uh, mined out the metal at the site. Uh, much of the easy metal uh, came out with the first owner, and then at, that owner dealt it off to a second owner. Uh, the second owner, realizing uh, after they had already purchased it, that um, what remained was a little harder to get at and was certainly hard to get at without, um, without uh, taking care of the asbestos. Well, they, they chose to you know, cut some corners on the asbestos. Many of us in the community now know that by 2014, um, they had uh, hired people with uh, street people with box cutters uh, to cut asbestos wrap off a pipe and just simply dropped it to the ground and left piles of free asbestos laying around at the site. Um, in my estimation, a pretty egregious uh, violation of the Clean Air Act. Um, by 2015, the Illinois EPA uh, sort of caught up with this situation, um, started investigating uh, what was going on at the site, actively uh, pursued an injunction uh, through the Sangamon County Courts. And in 2000, late 2015, uh, IEPA actually took control of the site, uh, locked up the front gate uh, so that the investigation could continue. Uh, throughout 2016 and into 17, a, a criminal case uh, was tried against the, the principal owners of the site at the time, P. Mills LLC. Uh, the net result of that was that uh, one of those principal owners uh, received a 37-month uh, prison sentence um, through the federal courts. Um, really a, a rare case uh, of a violation of the Clean Air Act um, going through the criminal process and actually resulting in a, uh, in a prison sentence. So um, 2017, uh, this is really where I get involved uh, at the time. I was uh, one of our lead public safety officials here in the city of Springfield uh, as our city fire marshal at the time. And I was tasked by our mayor with, with being the, the lead contact with the US EPA as they did an approximately $3 million emergency cleanup of, of the asbestos that was uh, free at the site. So throughout 2017, 220 plus tons of asbestos laden debris uh, was removed for this, from the site. Uh, many, many other chemicals were removed from the site. There's about a nine month period of intense work with 15 or 20 uh, highly trained hazardous materials disposal workers uh, all throughout that year. So it was an intense year. Um, EPA, US EPA contractors left the site in late 2017. In 2018, the, you know, the site was closed, just locked. It, Illinois EPA and the Attorney General's Office for the state of Illinois still had the site um, in, the, in the courts 
that it was it was tied tied up in a in a legal knot. Um, the owners weren't able to follow through on what the court was asking them to do, such that they could take possession of their property back. So there it, there it sat until late 2018. Uh, uh, some of us in, in Sprinkled recognized that there was uh, an arson incident that took place at the site. Um, clear, clear to understand by that time, uh, the site had become an attractive nuisance and, and a major uh, public safety hazard uh, within the community. By 2019 then, many of us uh, became aware uh, of the, the infamous dog incident, right? So in October of 2019, uh, a dog was found to be stuck on top of the silos, 110 feet in the air. Um, and there was nothing to be done about getting that dog down off of those silos. So, you know, obviously this became a, uh, about a week long uh, media uh, phenomena, let's say, uh, you know, people ask him, well, how, how did the dog get up there? Surely it didn't get up there by itself, and, 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 and why can't anybody do anything about it? This is a, a pretty hopeless situation. Um, and it was. It was very poignant, uh, very poignant that what we had going on at Pillsbury was a, a relatively hopeless situation. Now, it didn't end so well for the dog. Uh, the dog was found dead uh, within about a week or 10 days. Um, but that's the point at which um, a, a group of us uh, started to come together and say, look, you know, let's, let's see what, what can possibly uh, be done with this hopeless or semi-hopeless situation and how it, how it might start to be resolved. So in uh, 20, 2019, late 2019, this working group forms uh, eventually, you know, by 2020, we uh, put together a think tank, uh, which, which I've said it at many other community events. And essentially, that's what it was. We brought together 20, 30, 40 people. It, it kept expanding over the course of about three months. Uh, Polly was one of those early folks that, that got involved. Um, we put together a think tank, and in about four months' time, uh, we presented uh, what we felt was a workable and reasonable five-year plan for the site. And, uh, and we started to enact that plan. So in 2020, uh, we developed, uh, put together a not-for-profit organization. We, we formed in 2020. Uh, we started building capacity. And by 2021, we started untying this legal knot that existed at the site. And uh, in 2022, March of, uh, <laughs> coincidentally, March 24th, uh, 2022, one year ago today, moving Pillsbury forward actually took possession of the site. Uh, so this is the point at which our community took local control over what was happening at the Pillsbury site. And we now start to make decisions about what's happening here. And it's under our control as a community uh, to, to mold and shape what moves forward. So, um, I get asked uh, an awful lot, um, why did we take the project on, right? Um, this, is a, this is a huge challenge. Um, it was the right thing to do. You know, really, that's, that's the short answer. Uh, it's our community. Um, you know, I'm a lifelong Springfield resident. I care about what's going on in my community, all parts of my community. Um, and, you know, I've got a personal connection there, too. My father worked at the mill from 1970 to 1991. Um, it, 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 was, uh, it was the job that sent my brother and I to college. Um, so this is very meaningful to me personally. But just from a community-wide standpoint, it's the right thing to do. And, you know, if it's a long, even if it's a long shot, and I had, I had this discussion, if I had it once, I had it 100 times with folks, and especially folks that are my close friends, right? They're saying, Chris, are you sure you want to, you know, approach this? Because this is, there's, <laughs> if there's any light at the end of the tunnel, it's, it's, it's a little tiny dot at the end of the tunnel. And are you, are you sure that's something you want to do? You know, they're trying to give me an out. They're my friends. Uh, I said, no, no, you know, we're, we got to we got to do this. Um, you know, this this whole idea of waiting for big money to drop out of the sky and just solve it for us. Um, you know, that's 
pie in the sky stuff. Not gonna happen. I had that conversation with dozens of people as well, and unfortunately, a few of them were elected officials here in this town. Um, hopelessness, it's unacceptable. It's just that simple. It's unacceptable. We're not gonna have it in our community. That's why moving Pillsbury forward exists. So another question I get asked an awful lot, and I have been for going on four plus years now is, why isn't Pillsbury and Cargill responsible for the cleanup, right? You know, this is this whole notion of, surely somebody else needs to pay for this, right? And, and who is that legal responsible party for paying for this? Um, well, the fact of the matter is, from a legal standpoint, Pillsbury, certainly in, in 1991, or, or more correctly, Grand Metropolitan, who took over Pillsbury a few years earlier, um, they sold a perfectly functioning uh, mill to Cargill. Yes, there was asbestos there. Yes, there was lead paint and, and, and other issues, but this was a perfectly well-functioning mill. Um, this is a transaction just like any other commercial real estate transaction uh, where you've got a willing buyer and a willing seller, and these sort of things happen every day in the United States somewhere. Um, and it's perfectly legal. So Pillsbury, no real culpability here. Cargill, you know, so Cargill runs the plant as a mill for another 10 years, again, uh, very legally. Um, they didn't add to the problem. They didn't do anything egregious or, or illegal. And when they shut the mill down, they actively tried to market it for about seven years. And many folks in the community will rem remember in uh, 2005, after the mill had been shut down for nearly four years, we did a community charrette and, and problem solving, and we actually tried to figure out what to do with it at that time. Um, there was no consensus within the community at that time. Uh, Cargill recognized that. They saw that we were sort of floundering as a community to figure out what to do with it, so they went ahead and, and cut and ran. They sold it for scrap. Again, it was their legal right to do that. It was property they owned. Uh, they. They sold it in perfectly functioning condition uh, to a willing buyer. So again, no, no legal responsibility there. Um, ethically, I've talked to a lot of people in the community about this. Ethically, uh, they could have done more, right? They sold it to scrap dealers that quite likely, and they quite likely knew it, weren't weren't going to be capable of dealing with everything there. Uh, but then again, you know, we don't have a legal system that prevents folks from selling property, even to an owner, a new owner, that isn't necessarily prepared to deal with that property. Um, so that's essentially what happened from a, a legal and ethical s landscape. Um, so when moving Pillsbury forward formed, uh, we put that think tank together. You know, we came up with five identified areas of community benefit when the project's complete, right? And, I, and I've advertised these in the public before. You know, uh, the community benefit. You look at this and you say, you know, public safety, that's, that's almost a no-brainer. Um, this place uh, has active trespass uh, on a regular basis. It, it's an attractive place to be. Um, you know, we had this ugly inc arson incident that involved teenagers, or at least one teenager, yeah, two teenagers, uh, and a known arsonist in 2018. Uh, we got very lucky that, that something horrible didn't happen there. So public safety, health, uh, clearly this is a, this 18 acres of blight is a health benefit, is it attracts fly dumping on, on a regular basis, and, and we spent a, a good part of last year uh, dealing with the grounds and, and the fly dumping issue at the site that had piled up over the course of a number of years. So just from a public safety and public health standpoint, uh, there's community benefit to doing this project. Economics, uh, clearly uh, no taxes have been paid on this site for over 10 years. Um, 18 acres uh, that, you know, if we get it cleared, uh, you know, the hope is to actually turn this around, uh, put it back into production for the community. And when we say that, uh, right now, we, you know, we've done a high-end analysis on this uh, this past winter, and it looks like a, a, a fine site for a light industrial facility that, 
that uh, can bring jobs to the area and more economic activity. So we know there will be economic benefit when this project's complete. And then uh, the more sticky situations are the social justice and environmental justice issues related to the site. And again, I had long discussions and uh, you know, with the think tank, the Moving Pillsbury Forward group, uh, about just you know, just what do social and environmental justice issues look like? And what do they look like in our community as it relates to this site, but also sort of in broad form? And, uh, and how do those things sort of eat at and deteriorate your community? And how do you prevent that from happening so that you've got a healthy community? Um, so that's, um, that's where I bring in uh, Polly and John, right? They work on, uh, on these, these kind of issues on a, on a regular basis. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to John to help us kind of understand the environmental justice issue. And then uh, a few minutes later, we'll turn it over to Polly and she'll, she'll talk to us a little bit about the social justice issue of the site. And then, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have uh, a period of time for question and answer such that we can uh, ask any of the questions that you may have regarding the project as a whole. Thanks. But thank you, Chris, and thank you, John, for inviting me here today. It's a privilege to be here with you. My name is John Holzer. I'm an assistant U.S. attorney here at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Springfield, which is part of the broader Department of Justice. Uh, also a, a Springfield, a lifelong Springfield resident, went to Springfield High School, and uh, you know the, the safety and um, public health in this community is something near and dear to me, so I appreciate the opportunity to get to be here with you this morning. Um, I can speak a little uh, generally to a initiative that's going on right now through the Department of Justice. Uh, in November of last year, U.S. Attorney Greg Harris announced a environmental justice initiative. So it kind of begs the question, what exactly is environmental justice? Uh, environmental justice is essentially a, uh, a, uh, an approach, uh, a way of thinking um, in terms of enforcement of currently existing environmental laws, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. It doesn't create any new legislation or any new laws. And what environmental justice means is it's a recognition that all too often overburdened, underserved communities bear a disproportionate effect of uh, pollution and environmental crimes. And it's about collaboration with um, different federal partners uh, and state and local partners about what can be done to address uh, certain environmental bad actors uh, in these communities uh, because everybody deserves to have clean air, clean water, um, and, and, and equal enforcement of the environmental laws uh, in the community. So uh, the Department of Justice uh, works closely with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to identify um, uh, potential uh, uh, Clean Air Act violations, Clean uh, Water Act violations, illegal dumping, uh, pesticide um, uh, issues. Uh, it could even be related to um, uh, HUD or uh, lead paint related uh, offenses uh, and, and other um, types of federal violations that could have both civil or criminal uh, penalties. And uh, the penalties under the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act can be uh, quite hefty, uh, both from civil fines uh, and imprisonment for, for knowing violations of those, of those acts. So um, to kind of bring it home a little bit more to the, the Pillsbury plant and, and just kind of speaking a little bit uh, historically about that, um, as, as Chris mentioned, there was a criminal case that came out of the Pillsbury, um, the Pillsbury Mills plant uh, related to violations of the Clean Air Act. And how that worked, um, it, it had to do with the abatement of asbestos in the plant. And uh, the EPA has promulgated certain regulations that uh, require for the, the safe handling and disposal of asbestos. Uh, for example, um, there has to be a, a foreman or a supervisor on site who's trained in all the regulations and proper ways for handling asbestos. Um, if you're going to remove it, it's got to be uh, uh, wetted and, and taken down to keep the, the fibers from getting into the air and the dust and, and spreading into the community. Um, all of the asbestos has to be taken down prior to the demolition of the building because, again, you don't want the, the debris and the fibers getting up into the air. Uh, and then, of course, when you have the actual um, uh, asbestos materials, that's going to have to be disposed of at, a, at an authorized facility uh, in the proper manner. So uh, an EPA investigation in the, the Pillsbury plant led to an indictment, I think, in 2016 
um, for uh, an individual that uh, was, uh, as alleged in the indictment, not complying with those regulations uh, and in violation of the, the Clean Air Act. Uh, so, you know, there were certain concerns that he was not um, properly uh, abating the asbestos, not wetting it down, uh, commencing demolition prior to the safe removal uh, of the asbestos and not properly disposing of it as well. Uh, so that case did, as, as Chris mentioned, it, it resulted in a federal indictment uh, and a guilty plea in that case. Uh, but, but that's not the end of it. The EPA also um, stepped in and, and did what needed to be done in order to um, uh, cure the problems that were going on with the removal of the asbestos in that case. So uh, the EPA, uh, they, they came in, they brought in trained uh, persons who know how to properly remove the asbestos, uh, you know, as far as uh, wetting it down, uh, removing it. Um, they took measures to make sure that none of the fibers were, were getting up into the air, um, conducted tests, uh, monitored the air quality, uh, and did everything right. Uh, and as Chris mentioned, they ended up removing um, thousands and thousands of tons of asbestos material, making sure that that got disposed of uh, in the proper way. Um, they, they also certainly identified the environmental justice concerns. Uh, as Chris mentioned, 12,000 people uh, in an in underserved community live around the Pillsbury plant. Um, these are, are folks that could be susceptible to um, the, the negative health effects that would come from the Pillsbury plant. Uh, and so this was something that kind of qu they qualified for uh, environmental justice concerns uh, and, and serious enforcement of the Clean Air Act uh, in this case. Um, other examples of uh, in environmental justice concerns or areas where the federal government might be involved um, uh, would include the Clean Water Act and illegal dumping of uh, toxic chemicals into streams and riverways. Um, kind of the lesser known aspects might be um, the proper abatement and disposable, uh, disposal of lead paint, uh, kind of like asbestos or certain regulations or requirements that go in place when you're uh, treating a, an older home uh, that does have lead paint. Um, lesser known areas would have to do with uh, what we call the, the False Claims Act and people who receive federal funds, for example, for uh, subsidized housing. If somebody's receiving federal funds, they are required to certify to the government that they're providing safe, uh, uh, healthy uh, sanitary environments for the tenants, but you know, in some cases there may be uh, improper um, abatement of lead paint, uh, could be rats, mold, um, non-functioning air conditioning and heating, other conditions uh, that would uh, violate the, the conditions that they have to abide by in order to receive those federal funds. So those could be you know, another example of something that, that our office would, would take a look at as well. Um, I, probably just close by adding that uh, if uh, anybody has any questions about uh, environmental cases, both criminal or civil, uh, please feel free to reach out to our office. Our office's website has a, a dedicated page to environmental justice and how to contact our office and submit claims. Um, the EPA and DOJ websites as well also have more information about that. So thank you, Chris. Okay. Thank you, John. So, um, well, as we've all said up here, good morning. Um, and thank you, John Kelker, Citizens Club, happy birthday, Bob. Um, and all of you present today, um, I, we appreciate this opportunity to talk about the Pillsbury Project. Um, <coughs> Chris and I are joined by Tony Del Giorno, who couldn't be here today. Um, and I just want to tell you, um, Without Chris's leadership, I mean, I think you heard from him, his background, the knowledge he brings to just sort of the management of this very kind of massive project um, is very commendable. So thank you, Chris. And Tony, for those of you that don't know, is an attorney, so he protects us and keeps us safe. Um, my hope today is that <clears throat> you leave here knowing that the cleanup and the remediation and the demolition of the Pillsbury plant and site and its eventual redevelopment is about putting this particular 18 acres of land and the northeast side of Springfield on the table when new development to benefit our city, our businesses, our tourists, our tax rolls, our residents are discussed, promoted, and chosen. This is not to say that clearing the property at 1525 East Phillips is a magic wand. 
for revitalizing the northeast side of Springfield. But it is safe to say that if, if the abandoned, deteriorating, and dangerous properties at 1525 East Phillips are not cleared out, the site prepared for new use, there is far less, if not minimal, possibility for revitalization of our northeast quadrant. The entire community benefits, as Chris pointed out, when poor and marginalized neighborhoods experience significant reduction, if not elimination of the barriers to economic opportunity, environmental safety, affordable and sustainable housing, accessible health care, modern and functioning infrastructure, and fertile strategies by public officials for advancing growth for both individual citizens, businesses, and our entire Springfield. Let me describe the physical location of the Pillsbury plant in the adjacent Pillsbury neighborhood. If you need to, close your eyes for a moment and envision the border of the Pillsbury neighborhood. It's 11th to 19th Street, Carpenter to North Grand. Now I ask you at some point to open your eyes, get in your car, open your mind and your heart and drive the Pillsbury neighborhood. The Pillsbury neighborhood is near the heart of the city of Springfield. The surrounding area is diverse and includes residential, commercial, industrial, and recreational land uses. The area is located in census tracts seven and eight. It's a combined population in that kind of particular area of about 4,228 people. Maybe a few more residents on the outside. Specifically, the tracks are home to some of the most impoverished neighborhoods in our entire city. With poverty rates at about the 94 percentile, low to moderate income population. Both census tracts in this area have been characterized by the federal government as disadvantaged. The median household income is $25,000. The median home value is $50,000. The median age is about 23, and 25% have an education less than a high school diploma. The former Pillsbury Mill site has limited connections to the city's growth. Redevelopment plans for the Pillsbury Mills would move this space forward. To achieve social benefits associated with this area, the social justice of the issue, an abandoned site containing about 580,000 square feet of structure, some of which are eight to 10 stories tall, on 18 acres of land, largely concrete, we, moving Pillsbury forward, had to engage not only the neighbors in the surrounding area, but our entire city. So how to achieve community engagement in order to shift the paradigm about who benefits and who loses at the decision-making table when the redevelopment priorities of our city are selected? Well, in November of 2019, as Chris pointed out, we began with Chris's leadership, sort of this coming together a small group of individuals who wanted to do something about Pillsbury. Then we had a large community meeting in November of 2019 at Lanfear High School. We had another one in January of 2020. And then about, I would say, between 75 and 100 folks attended one or the other of those meetings. And then as we all know, we took a pause for COVID and that interrupted our community meetings until April of 2022 when we met again at Lanfear High School. And then our latest meeting was in October of 2022 at Wanda School. And that's where we had a report out from our geologist uh, that you saw in the film from Fairgram Engineers to talk about the um, report from the phase two environmental site assessment. So, and there was also a required public meeting at um, Lincoln Library, our Springfield Public Library, um, as, as um, to discuss the parameters of a federal grant that we were applying for. So with, with Chris leading us, um, we, moving, moving Pillsbury um, forward had its first walk around at the plant. Uh, one of the things that, that happened at the plant was the clearing of the debris, the scrap metal, and acres of um, you know pop-up trees, weed trees, weed bushes, um, 
tr Chris is mighty with a chainsaw. Um, and um, uh, so we got it cleared so that at least it not only kind of visually improved for the neighborhood, um, but it also became accessible. Um, for people, um, folks who maybe had worked there, their families had worked there, to just sort of see uh, Pillsbury be on the land. I don't need to tell people in this town, I mean, this was an economic driver for this community. Um, th this was a source of pride um, in the community for many years. And some people just wanted to touch base with it again. And then other people really wanted to learn what's involved, you know, with trying to address the remediation, the demolition, and the repurposing. So we've had two walk-arounds, I think, since then. Um, and um, Chris, again, leading the way. We've had numerous press conferences. Um, we've done a presentation a couple times to our city council and to the county board. And we've highlighted um, community engagement. Um, the, the ultimate redevelopment of the Pillsbury site um, is, is, is the goal. But first, it has to be in a, in a state safely um, and, um, you know, with attention to people's health, that, that it can be redeveloped. Um, so we also keep a, a mailing list of about 300 folks. And when there's any activity or event prior to something at Pillsbury, whether it be the walk around, whether it be the announcement of the, um, the grant that we received through Senator Durbin's office. Chris notifies the folks through that email chain and then gets a lot of feedback, lets people know when they can come. Um, we're very generous about uh, responding to requests for walk-arounds and, and people being able to see the site. It also puts people in place. Um, you can't get to Pillsbury without coming through the neighborhood. Um, you can't get to Pillsbury without coming to the northeast side of Springfield. Um, you can't get to Springfield without seeing um, what needs to be addressed comprehensively for our city. So environmental justice, which you heard from John, um, is, is connected. It is connected to economic justice. It's connected to racial justice. And it's connected to this whole notion of the institutional racism and the classism that we experience in, in, uh, in our nation. Um, that many times prohibits and creates barriers for people to have the kind of access to enjoy a, a livable environment and a hopeful future. You can read historical reports that prove communities of color were far more subject to the environmental degradation and pollution as a result of abandonment. So environmental issues, particularly pollution and abandoned, deteriorating and dangerous structures, and especially as large and massive as the size at the Pillsbury site, communities are stripped of their most basic rights. Clean water, clean air, safe housing, and an up-to-date, reliable, functioning infrastructure. The fact is, poor neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods, are more likely to face risky, if not hazardous, and deadly living conditions because they lack the political, historical, and current ability to be at the table when decisions are made about how we shift the decisions when we talk about redevelopment. So we believe at Moving Pillsbury Forward that we can reverse the current reality and, and the future possibility of the Pillsbury neighborhood by bringing more fair treatment and to minimizing the decisions that are made often that shift development and prosperity away from what traditionally is needed to revitalize what was once the economic driver of a community. We believe that citizen involvement is the key. And that's why we deeply appreciate the Citizens Club and, and your participation here. No single portion of the population should be disproportionately affected by a Pillsbury crisis or the result of intentional laws or policies, or the lack of fair policies that mitigate against inequity and the violation of the principles of democracy. And that is participation by the people and environmental justice and income justice and racial justice as we make determinations about what will be the quality of life for specific neighborhoods and for our entire community. It is our hope that we don't marginalize minorities. It's our hope that we don't marginalize any section of the city. 
And we're trying not to stand out. We wish to fit in. We don't believe there are any heroes. There might be a few villains, but there are no heroes in this project. We're all here together. We believe that social justice promotes fairness and equity in the democratic process. We believe that quality housing, equal economic opportunities, and the safety and security, as you heard Chris emphasize, for our individuals and communities. The Pillsbury Project in Springfield, Illinois, once that remediation and demolition occurs at Pillsbury, that we believe that we will offer that land for the redevelopment that results in a better neighborhood, a better area of the city, and our entire city. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. We do have time for questions. A little bit different this morning. Um, we're going to ask anyone that has a question to come forward. We have a microphone here as opposed to the roving one. So if anyone wants to come up, please, we have a question. I'm going to start real quick with an easy one that we're all aware of. Any kind of an update on the Doughboy? <laughs> yes, there is. You know, this is something that uh, kind of exploded out there in the last couple of months. Um, you know, we've, you know, it's been widely reported now, right? We found a, what we believe is an early, very early Doughboy image in uh, December of last year. Uh, several people that actually took the, uh, the tour that we, we offered, the second tour in December, uh, had an opportunity to see the Doughboy in place as it, in situ, as they say in archaeology. Um, and we have now secured it. But um, yes, the update is I've, I've been in contact to, because the media helped us get the story out. I'm now in contact with the, the family of the presumed artist. Yeah. And I, I, I can go beyond saying presume, the artist of that Doughboy. I can, I can say that with confidence. Uh, was a man named, named Wynn Wilkins, that uh, wonderful story, actually worked at, at Pillsbury uh, for a time, and then he and his best friend joined the war effort for World War II, joined the Navy. Uh, they came back, they both uh, got jobs at Pillsbury. Wynn was a, um, a commercial artist, and a, and, and and, he, and he's, he's got a whole, <laughs> uh, I, I've seen a portfolio of his works at this point. Clearly this is a man that had the capability and the talent uh, and, the, and the vision to be the guy that, that produced the Doughboy. I've interviewed the family. Um, they, have, uh, they haven't decided exactly what they want to do yet as far as public statements and whatnot. But, uh, you know, and they, they need some time and space to decide that. But um, the investigation continues. I'm still you know, looking for leads and tips and maybe photographs of other early Doughboys. And what we're trying to do is prove that this local gentleman that was, uh, uh, is now buried out in Camp Butler Cemetery as a World War II vet is actually the, the originator of the Doughboy. I, I'm convinced of that, but I'd still like to find proof from out there in the community. So if, if, if there are folks out there uh, that may have some, some more stories to add, some photographs, some actual sketches, we are all ears. So just look <laughs> us up at uh, pillsburyproject.org. And there, there, there will be more to come, I'm sure. Thank you, Chris. Please, come back. Feel free to use the microphone. Well, I'm Tom Hurst. My dad worked at Pillsbury for 40 years. Uh, we actually have a cookie jar. I know that's got to be at least 50 years old as the Doughboy. Uh, but one question is, is there any part on the east side that's still owned by the railroad? Uh, and in that, uh, and then if you want to have an example of what could be, is look at 6th Street at the old Fiat Alice uh, site that you didn't realize how big that was until it was all torn down and it goes all the way from 6th to 11th. Uh, and now there's, what, dozens of businesses there. Uh, and so hopefully that would be, ideally, something like that could be for the Pillsbury site. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and I'd say, and I didn't know about it, like, say, my question, if there's any part of that still owned by the railroads. Sure. The, um, 
you know, the Pillsbury site's an 18-acre site that's uh, kind of triangular. The other triangle that is just a little bit bigger than 18 acres is actually the active... It's, um, it's owned by the Wyoming Genesee Railroad, uh, very active here. Locally, it's known as the Illinois and Midland uh, Rail Yard. Uh, again, it's an active rail yard. The, this past year, they've done a multi-million dollar upgrade to that rail yard. Uh, we're Illinois, we're the center of commerce in North America, and we have been for over 150 years since the I&M Canal was built. Um, we've, when the site is cleared at Pillsbury, we'll have an 18 acre industrial site situated right next to a very active rail yard with five class one uh, railroads that can access that yard. Um, so we're quite confident that uh, redevelopment uh, can happen there in a commercial way. As you mentioned, you know, Fiat Alice is one of our sort of community victories from the late 80s, early 90s, uh, when that entire area that is now Park South uh, was redeveloped um, and, and continues to be redeveloped, right? The, the school district just bought a tract of land there uh, for redevelopment and uh, their administrative offices and, and, and school, uh, new school there. Um, so. The, the, the future certainly can be bright for Pillsbury, just as bright as it was for the Piat Alice uh, facility. So what's the first thing you hope to do about, take, what, what's the immediate next step for taking something down or whatever you're gonna do next? <laughs> yeah, um, immediate next steps. Um, I'll have a quick highline discussion about where we're at. Uh, we, we received a grant last fall from the US EPA uh, for technical assistance. They brought in brownfield consultants that work on sites, uh, commercial industrial sites all throughout the uh, United States. I think this last year, the consultants we worked with uh, juggled 40 different locations. Uh, these are very professional people uh, that deal with these sites. Uh, year after year after year. Uh, they came in, uh, they helped us measure exactly what we have and, and, and where we might wanna go, what kind of grant opportunities are out there. And at the end of the day, we found out this is about a $10 million project to clear the site. Um, we now have $4 million worth of financial commitments between the city and federal government. Next steps, uh, this past uh, week or two weeks or three weeks, uh, Polly and I have been working diligently on letters of support and uh, grant writing uh, through the congressional offices here in Illinois, as well as at the State House, trying to leverage funds at the State House and then uh, through the county as well. So we're putting together that financial stack that gets us closer and closer and closer to that $10 million mark that we know we need uh, to grapple with this site uh, in the next three years. Um, Four million dollars that we have committed at this point, there will be large-scale remediation and demolition activities taking place there in the next 12 months. I'm quite confident of that. It's just a matter of how many dollars can we get and what's the, the sequence that we want to <coughs> do with that. That's all, uh, um, we've got more than 20 structures at the site. Some are higher priority than others. Some have less remediation concerns. It's sort of a lot to tease through uh, with our civil and environmental engineers. Um, but we're, we're fine tuning uh, that sequencing uh, right now and matching that up with our financing. And as soon as we do that, we can put some RFPs out and do some, uh, some large scale activities at the site. And that'll happen, no doubt, in the next 12 months. Anyone else with one final question? Yes, yeah. sir. I'll, I'll, I'll stay in here because I have a loud voice. Uh, under the category of it doesn't hurt to ask, have you approached Pillsbury or Cargill, because their name is on it, simply as a goodwill gesture with no admittance of liability for any kind of donations? Thank you. Um, the short answer is yes to Pillsbury. Um, and they've sort of declined to engage. <laughs> um, you know, and in all fairness to Pillsbury, I think, you know, as Chris pointed out, as you all know, really Cargill bought it from Pillsbury. We just know it as Pillsbury. Um, if I were to hold um, corporate America more accountable, 
um, for these rust belt remnants. Um, Cargill should probably be the focus. Um, I think what's interesting to me is we, we don't have law that mitigates against an entity such as Cargill with a uh, site such as Pillsbury from selling to um, a buyer that really has no capacity to do what needs to be done. I mean, there's something, I, I don't want to get in the way of people like Chris was pointing out who have the right to legally purchase or sell to one another. Um, but at some point, where does the responsibility lie? Because if government permits folks, you know, to corporate folks to abandon, you know, a place like this, um, what are they left with? They're left with other people, whether it be city or county governments or not-for-profits, clamoring at their door for the money to take care of it. Um, there's something skewed about that. So we will, we will keep our efforts up. Um, we do have legal counsel to make sure as we pursue um, the, this notion of, of our doughboy um, that we don't step on Pillsbury's toes. Um, we don't need a cease and desist letter. But, um, so yeah, we're gonna continue um, that avenue, um, but I will tell you that um, two letters, and I, I was inspired to do so by Jeff Schneider, uh, some of you may know Jeff, but um, to contact them, and um, it, with two back and forth, um, it was pretty clear um, they're not coming down for the wrecking ball. Um, so we'll just have to keep at it. Thank you. And I want to extend a thank you to Chris, John, and Polly for joining us this morning. We look forward in the coming years to, to hear updates on your work. Again, if you will, yes, thank you. Mark your calendars. Our next program is April 28th.